for coming on this beautiful day. We have so few of them. Nice day to learn about these fascinating creatures. For those of you who don't know, I'm Linda Shire, um, current director of the Acton Wakefield Watersheds Alliance. I want to introduce John Balanoff. Hello. He's a director in training. <laughs> so um, you guys will all be seeing more of John. Um, as you know, we work to protect the water quality in the lakes and ponds of Wakefield and Acton, the border region of Acton. And one of the ways we do that is by getting people excited about the natural world. And so we do this series called, we call Water Talks. And this is our last one this spring. Um, so we brought Pam Hunt from New Hampshire Audubon to talk about dragonflies, which you know we all see out there and we know they eat bugs. Um, when we take our sixth graders out to do stream sampling, we find all sorts of varieties of their nymphs, so I'm eager to learn more about that. We're going to be doing that soon up at the Province Lake Golf Course. So um, let Pam take it away. Thank and you. Thank you all for coming. All right. So, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, because if you can't, too bad. No. If you can't, if you can't just throw something at me and yell or whatever. Um, and this, just as a warning, this is a very audience participation talk, and people get picked on if you don't participate. <laughs> and there's, there's all sorts of things going on that you'll obviously deal with. So yeah, I'm from Nantra Audubon. Just a quick question I always ask people, who here is a member of Nantra Audubon? <laughs> Yay, everyone! Um, how many of you don't even live in New Hampshire? So there's a problem. We should move over. <laughs> who are you members of Maine Audubon? Ah, I think you didn't think I was going to do that. <laughs> so, you know, if you're interested in conserving wildlife and wildlife habitats and stuff like that, you know, consider thinking about it. But you can only join some organizations, and I'm not a pitch person for anybody. But think about it. Um, that's why I'm here. So, yeah, this talk is on dragons and damsels of New Hampshire, and Linda kind of had things wrong because this is what the talk's about. <laughs> not really. Okay. So, right off the bat, I have a question for you. And we don't go on to the next slide until someone gets it. And this could take, I don't have to be back in the doctor until dinner. <laughs> um, so, and this, this is a hard question to answer because it's a hard, it's a stupid question. But we always test people and this gets you in the right frame of mind to, to help out with this. You can describe dragonflies in two words. And this picture is kind of the clue, but no one ever gets it. But we'll start with seeing if people can toss out one or two of those words and see if we can get closer and I'll help you out as we go. Insect. Flying insect. Flying is one of the eyes. One of the, oh, I just gave the answer. <laughs> <laughs> Flying eyes. I totally spit. I'm going to go now. I totally <laughs> People always say insect, that's too obvious. This is like the zen of a dragonfly. Dragonflies are flying eyes, and we'll get more to that than we know. So, and the cool thing about dragonflies, oh, I forgot that part. Um, they're, they're, they're the insect order of nada. I'll call the odes all the time. It's a lot shorter than saying dragonflies. When I say odes, I mean dragonflies and amplifies. They're both parts of the same larger group. And the cool thing about them is that they've been around a very, very, very long time. They were among the first insects to leave water. Um, you know, 300 million years ago, there were dragonflies flying around the swamps of the world. Um, some of them had two foot wingspans. They would eat your Pomeranian, they would eat your cat, and take your children inside every day. If there were children, or cats, or Pomeranians back then. This one is from the Jurassic, it's like 150 million years ago, so it was probably relatively small. Now, you know, think about it. Do I find this big? It's bigger than, you know, a pigeon. <laughs> and you don't want to mess with those. Some of the really primitive ones had six wings. So, a little bit of basic entomology. Again, participation is important. Because, you know, the AWWA will grade you on this. <laughs> do things to you if you get it wrong. Um, what are the three body parts of an insect? You all know this nice little biology hasn't changed for, since Linnaeus or Aristotle, so you shouldn't should say it's a different than I would have called it. There we go. Bonus points. 
points. Uh, the bonus points will be given out liberally. They are redeemable for nothing. <laughs> but did people get excited about it? They could be redeemable for cookies. So the first part is the head, and then the dragonfly. This is basically eyes. So here's here's one eye. There's a little face thing. The mouth is right here. Um, What's that little black thing? You know what the black thing is? The antenna. It's the antenna. How many people have seen dragonfly art with big curly or wiggly antenna on it? Who's seen that? It's okay, don't be embarrassed. If you own it, either wipe it out or erase it or throw it out, because those are dragonflies. People put antenna on dragonflies, and those dragonflies on antenna are these little tiny things that actually have no function whatsoever. They evolve dragonfly sense is primarily sight. They can see almost 360 degrees. There's a little blind spot in the very back of their head. Think back to that first picture, you know, basically there's just two giant eyes. And if, if you were to, if, you, if your eyes were as big as proportionate to your body as a dragonfly's, you would have a football helmet on either side of your head. So just you know, imagine eyes like that with thousands of individual facets that are processing information all at the same time and making an image. That in fact, if I can see and actually respond to catching a mosquito out of the air, I think you can see. So the head is where the eyes are, and so the mouth is, so it's where they see the things, and then they see keep the things that they see. In the middle is the thorax, which is basically the locomotion center. The wings and legs are all attached to the thorax, organs go through, the, the heart is in there. Insects don't have a circuitry system, they have a heart and people live with more blood that just sloshes back and forth like in your water bottle. And so they're kind of funky that way. Fun, fun man in fact, like got from the bottom of a snapple lid, is that dragonflies have legs, but guess what they can't do? Walk. They land on stuff, they walk when they're nymphs in the water. But adult dragonflies cannot walk. They just land and take off and perch. It's, and they use their legs mainly for catching prey. They make a net like this, and they just scoop things up. You can see little spines that they can catch things with. And then we've got the abdomen, which is mostly, partially for balance, because they, they need to be you know, balanced when they're flying. The digestive system ends up there. But the main part of the abdomen is very fun for is reproduction, and we'll get to that shortly. Um, some stuff happens here, some stuff happens there. It's going to be very complicated and very naughty. <laughs> so kids, beware. <clears throat> and this is the question everybody always asks. I made a special slide for it, so I wouldn't forget to ask it and give it away before um, I got the chance to ask you guys what the difference is. Anybody know? You know no, I can stop anytime. <laughs> Are the cancel place That's one answer. We'll see if you're right, but I love you all that answer. Because you already answered once. You're doing good. I don't want you to pop all the attention. <laughs> the position of their wings when position they land? The wings when they land is really one of the classic answers. And there's a third, so the skin answer is right, so I'm not going to subtract anything. And one more? The eyes, the large compass the eyes. The eyes, there's a bit of difference in the eyes, but it's not as dramatic as one other thing. Anybody want to go? Tails? I think that's kind of what you're getting with the skinniness, right? Well, don't they have extra tails? Though? No, those are mayflies. Oh boy, we have to start back there. <laughs> <laughs> mayflies and dragonflies are close related, but they're different orders. And the other ones, this side has been pretty quiet. I don't know, there's more people on that side. <laughs> the other difference is that the dragonfly wings, the front and back wings, are different shapes. And the dancefly's, the front and back wings, are the exact same shape. And this picture shows it pretty well. <laughs> so on the right is a dancefly. A big one, actually. We'll get to that in a second. And all four wings are lined up right there. And this little dragonfly, these are both in Costa Rica just for fun, the front wings tend to be shaped like this, and the hind wings have this big, long, straight bit, and then it curves back around. So the, the actual Latin names are Anisoptera, which means different wings, and Zyoptera, which means same wings. So the dragonflies have a very long, slender abdomen, their wings are all the same shape, and they fold them together when they're at rest. And the dragonflies have stocky abdomens. They hold the wings out, and their front and back wings are different. There's exceptions to prove the rule for all of these. Um, we'll get to that in a little bit. The critter on the right is one of the largest odonates on the planet. 
that thing's a down the fly. People often say down the flies are smaller, and no one said that, so we all get a bonus point. Even for silence, there's bonus points. That thing is seven inches long with like a six inch wingspan. And it flies around the rainforest in, in Central America, um, picking insects out of spider webs. So it goes up to a spider web, hovers, picks an insect out, and, and eats it. So this is a pretty cool thing to do. I'm not going to talk about Costa Rican rodent legs. Um, but so yeah, so this little guy is actually about this big. So that's a dragonfly that's smaller than the damn. So size is not an important thing, but the shape and the wings are the key, key differences. Any, I'm going to talk about the life cycle next and then some habitat stuff, but that's just some real basic things. Did I miss anything that's really obvious? If I, if I'll tell a talk later, I'll tell you that I'll talk about it later. But if there's any other quick questions right now, I'll just jump right in. Good. Okay, so we think about dragonflies as these cool flying insects that zip around eating bugs. You know, that's even partially how we introduced this. She also mentioned the important part, which is that they're also in the water. The, terrestri the flying dragonfly you see is generally a tiny part of its life. The flying dragonfly will live one to two months most of the time. The larva, or nymphs, depending on who you talk to, the baby ones in the water, live for most of the time from one to four years. Lots of the dragonflies that live in streams or cold lakes where there's not a lot of resources, not a lot of food, will take three or four years from being laid as an egg to being emerging in form. So they spend three years in the water and two weeks of <coughs> two months in the air. So they're really aquatic insects that fly around to have sex. <laughs> they eat and then they have sex. So what happens? Oh wait, I forgot to part of the story. So this dragonfly here, a lot of dragonflies are territorial like birds are. This male is patrolling a little area of the pond, say back and forth, back and forth. You may have seen this. And he's saying, this is my turf. If a female comes in here, she's mine. If you're another male, get out of dodge. And they'll do this. They'll sit on, sit on branches and chase things away. And females, meanwhile, are out in the woods somewhere getting ready to mate. They're not getting anywhere near the pond until they're ready to mate because it's like a single bar. And they just throw up there and they get attacked by males and try to mate. Female shows up, the male grabs her. This is your standard dating practice amongst the damselflies and dragonflies, where the male has little structures at the end of his abdomen called circe that are sh different shapes, and they actually grab the back of the female's neck. <coughs> in damselflies, there's actually little depressions in the female's neck that those fit into, so that male A cannot mate with female B. In lots of dragonflies, it's a little coarser, they just grab them, and sometimes they actually poke the back of their eyes with their Cersei. But the male always grabs the female with his Cersei, and that's like, okay, we are now dating, you're my mate, this is going to be great. And this is well, cool. This is called, in the insect Kama Sutra, the tandem position. We say all the tandem pair of dragonflies, it means the male has got a female, they're going to be doing something later. Now, this is where it gets tricky, though. The male produces sperm at the end of his abdomen. The female's eggs are at the end of her abdomen. So the sperm has to go from here to here. Is there a problem? <laughs> <laughs> Is there a solution? What's, what happens if he lets go to try to match up? You sometimes see the other insects doing the thing like this when um, they're mating. So if he lets go, what's going to happen? Come on, you guys have been good so far. She's gonna tip down. She's gonna fly away, or even worse. Someone I think said it quietly. Eat them? No, well that could be bad for you. Right? <laughs> Another male might zip in there. Ha <laughs> ha! He's not looking. <laughs> Boom! I can get her. So what the male has way up here are a set of secondary structures called secondary genitalia, which is just a funky thing to think about. And what he does is he takes the sperm, when he produces sperm, he actually curls his abdomen around and inserts them here. There's a little structure there that stores them. And then he's ready. So he'll do that before he mates. He'll do that while he's mating, which is kind of fun, thinking of the Kama Sutra. And 
Then he's ready for fertilizer because what's next? Who, who's seen what happens next when you're looking at dragonflies outside? Doesn't she curl around and attach? Extra cookie for you. <laughs> <laughs> so she curls around and now her ovipositor right here is in contact with his sperm storage thing. And this is called the wheel position. And they, you'll see dragonflies flying around like this. They're, they're both flat. Or you'll see them flying around like a tandem bicycle, flying in the air, one trailing out the other. They're, they're just so good at flying that they can do that sort of shit. Sorry, Jason. Um, so this is now she's not being fertilized. But there's one more funky piece to this story. And at the, sa the same place, in that little male secondary tail, it's like a Swiss army knife. There's all sorts of little structures in there. One of those is a little scoop that can actually remove sperm from a previous male. So if a male mates with female, if male A mates with female A, then he leaves, she goes, okay, I'm going eggs. Male B shows up, says, ha ha ha, grabs her, does the whole thing, and he scoops out male A's sperm and replaces it with his own. And then, it's, then the eggs are his kids. So there's crazy stuff going on with insects and reproduction. And so that's just another fun little thing that I usually feel, don't try this at home. So once the female's ready, she will go lay eggs. And there's two ways of laying eggs. In all the damselflies, and then these big dragonflies called darners, they have a little knife-like blade, you can see it right there, called the ovipositor, which slices into vegetation. In this case, you know, it looks like maybe one of these grass stems, they'll do it in rotten twigs, they'll do it in floating leaves, or lily pads, whatever else. And they actually insert the eggs into the plant. It doesn't really hurt the plant. Sometimes you'll see little tiny scars on cattail stems and things from this. All the other dragonflies overposit directly into water. You may have seen like a slug machine thing where they're flying on the boop, 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 boop. Those are laying eggs, and the eggs sink to the bottom of the pond or whatever and do their thing there. The eggs don't stay as eggs very long, with one exception, which we'll get to. They hatch out within a couple of days. The little teeny wiggly prolips or prolarva. The, the eggs are like the size of the poppy seed. And they have these little tiny larvae, and those who eat little tiny things, get bigger, shed their skin, eat some more, get bigger, shed their skin. Again, one to four years, they'll be doing that. Until they really get big enough, they can, you know, they're going to start coming out of the water. And this is a, this is a, a darner, darner nymph. This is about this long, or a little over an inch long. And when they get big enough, they're going to climb out of the water and get ready to emerge as dragonflies. And what you can see on this one is that it's ready to do that. For one thing, it's on top of the sphagnum moss in this bog. Otherwise, they're deep in the mud or in leaf litter, moving around. But he's got these wing buds. If you looked at the younger larva, they don't have those until they're older. And inside of that little critter is basically a dragonfly coming out. These are like walking, a herd of colleagues once called these walking pupa. Because they're going on their metamorphosis, like a butterfly does. They've been this aquatic critter that breathes air, eats aquatic insects with a really cool jaw that shoots out and grabs things and pulls them back in, if you've seen the movie Alien. <laughs> um, literally, literally their, lower, their jaw is, so if this thing had its jaw extended, it would come up to here. With little pinchers at the end, and it sneaks up on food, goes, ching, grabs it, pulls it back. So they've got totally different mouth parts, they don't have wings, they breathe water, they're aquatic, they're very different critters. So they actually have to reorganize their tissues a little bit like anything that's monomorphosis and come back out as a dragonfly later. So they actually are not eating for a while, I can't remember how long, between before they come out. So they're like walking cocoons. Not as gross as a butterfly. You cut a cocoon open, what's inside? Green slime. So they climb out of the water. So here's one climbing up to a bridge, a bridge abutment. It'll kind of get ready. It'll sort of sit there. It'll actually let itself dry out. And that's going to crack the, the shell, right? The, so the back of its head and the front of its thorax. And then, speaking of the movie Aliens, this happens. <laughs> <laughs> this dragonfly comes out of the skin of the one that was its skin. So it's basically shedding its skin one more time. And then the dragon flies up that one. And then that skin at the bottom is called an exuvia and is left behind. And I've got some examples of them up here. And eventually comes all the way out, puts those wings out, and is ready to fly away. And there's the exuvia left behind. It's 
two different kinds. There's a big one and a small one. One of my favorite things when I was doing dragonfly work more intensely was canoeing on rivers and picking these off the riverbanks and putting them in jars and identifying them later. Because it's like you can get 15 or 20 species on a good river. Um, and it's just really fun. And some of these ones on rivers you can't actually catch because they're flying. And you can't try catching a dragonfly from a kayak sometimes. <laughs> it doesn't work. Okay, so that's the little life cycle story. But what I've got here is, is a little time lapse. I thought if, you, if you're ever along a river or a stream or a lake, whatever, and you see a dragonfly nymph out of the water, you should watch it. Unless you're bleeding to death or giving birth, you've got 20 minutes to 40 minutes to do this. Um, and you'll see what's going to show up here. This, was, this series of pictures was taken over about 20 minutes. And it's, I just I took the little guy, put my net in the kayak so I could just stay still and not have to worry about the boat moving, and took pictures like a lot, and then just took a bunch of them. So just watch. You watch the wings in a second. So we'll lunch forward now, and then the stuff starts happening. Is that cool or what? So again, if you see this, watch it because it's pretty cool. Now this one actually um, had already got a head start. You can see that little fuzz? That's the back of the dragonfly. It's already split right here. That might even be the eye. This little white stripe is the remains of its aquatic breathing apparatus. They've got these you know, little tubes that connect the um, outside to the inside. And obviously, that's basically stretching and snapping. <laughs> so they'll have another hole on the new insect versus on the old insect. So you'll see these leftover little tracheae, the breathing tubes on the thing. So that it's basically, sit, once it gets out of the water, it sort of sits still for a while, then it cracks the shell. So it's already done that. And then it's going to pop its head out pretty quickly. You can see that little thing stretching. And it's going to snap soon, boink. And then it pulls itself out. It's going to sit there for a while as it's kind of getting itself untangled and getting flexing and stretching exercises to lunge forward like it did, grab the substrate, and then start pumping blood into its abdomen and wings. All those little veins in the wings, it's pumping hemolymph into those to expand them out. So those things were jammed into those little tiny wing buds. And then basically that the blood mostly retracts back into the body. There's not circulation in the wings. The wings are like fingernails. They're just dead. They don't grow or change. If the wing breaks, it's not going to regrow. And then the abdomen is still a lot, of, a lot of liquid in here, so I'm eventually get rid of that and the thing will get slenderized again. So that took 20 minutes. The big ones might take 45 minutes, but it's just a really cool thing to see. And you're highly encouraged to try to find it. And so once it's done with that, it's going to probably open the wings up. And now it's called a tenable dragonfly, which means it's just emerged. It hasn't actually hardened up yet. Those wings are very soft and flexible. It's like, it's like saran wrap. What's wrong with this dragonfly? One, missing one, wing. Wing. one wing is not missing. It's just all messed up. So like I, I said these are like saran wrap. They act like saran wrap. You have the saran wrap up, you get it stuck on something else, and you, it becomes that, and you throw it out. If the dragonfly's wing, while it's being expanded, gets caught on a branch or a piece, a drop of water falls on it, it will totally mess up that wing and pre prevent the blood from going out through those veins and the wing will not expand. And this dragonfly cannot fly. This dragonfly is in the UNH insect collection now. Um, it actually was the first adult specimen of that species from the Connecticut River, which is now just out there everywhere. I've seen um, dragonflies with only one expanded wing, and that one isn't even going to try to fly. It sort of it sits there and it can tell somehow. So it's like, okay, I'm going to sit on this bridge above and until a miracle happens. <laughs> and it never does. You know, I've seen them wrapped around grass stems, so there's one popped out. And I was over at um, over in New Durham on the way over here today doing some surveys. There's a huge emergence of dragonflies at um, Marsh at Chalk Pond in New Durham. And there were some of them that were stuck to plants. Some of them were falling in the water because the wind had blown probably 
you know, at some point, and they got all tangled up. I have a question. So when I was younger, I used to try to help them unwrap that very it's gently, not, but yeah, if it's, it doesn't, they're, 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 it doesn't you know, work. By the time they're wrapped up, they're going to be already, okay. the thing isn't going to be able to pump itself out again. It's like putting a tourniquet on, right? And then not taking it off. And then your okay. arm is eventually kind of out of luck. Yes? What was the term you used for that state? Tenerel. T-E-N-E-R-E-L or A-L. And then it's going to fly off into the woods or wherever it goes, spend a few days eating and getting sexually mature, and then if it's a male, it comes back, sets up its territory, and it's ready to start the whole thing over again. The females will come back a couple of days later. Sorry? Oh, I'm sorry? I've never seen one. That's a gorgeous critter. With, the, with that coloring in the wings before. Go to, go to Chalk Pond in New Durham tomorrow. Really? There's literally hundreds of them emerging there today. Um, and somewhere else too, I'm sure. So that's the life cycle. Any questions about the life cycle? Did I forget anything? Sometimes I do. Is there a difference between larva and nymph? Um, depends who you talk to. Some people, <coughs> technically a larva means it goes through this dormant stage like a butterfly does. And then has a, so a larva is a stage, egg, larva, pupa, adult. So butterflies, and ants, beetles, all those things that have grown through caterpillars. Nymph means egg, nymph, adult. So grasshoppers, bugs, mayflies, kind of. Because these guys have that weird non-feeding stage where they're reorganizing stuff, some people want to call them larva because it sounds cooler. And they're, so they're really dragonfly nymphs or they're their own thing. People usually call them nymphs, the purists say nymphs, some of us sort of narrative wells have gotten to this later say larva. I, I say both because I hear people say both. It's confusing. Yes? Uh, and I apologize, I do a couple minutes late. The breathing underwater, like somewhere where they do it through their tail? They, well, it depends. The dragonflies have to call it this anal breathing. I didn't talk about breathing. Um, where they just suck water in through their butt, <coughs> exchange oxygen with the insides of their body, and then squirt it back out again. The amplifies have little gills at the end of their abdomen. So there's all abdomen base, but yeah, they basically, the, the dragonflies suck water in and squirt it back out, which is also how they move. They propel themselves with that. So yeah, does that answer? Yep. So they have gills in their butt area. But yeah, they've got internal anal gills, essentially. And the, the, the damselflies have these big leafy things. You said the, uh, the next stage, or the water stage, can be one to four years. Yeah. So what uh, factors determine how long it's in the next stage? For? Usually temperature and, and food availability. So the long-lived ones tend to be big rivers and streams where it's you know low oxygen, I mean high oxygen, but low, low decomposition, so there's a smaller food chain, mm -hmm. or high elevation or farther north. But they can't thrive in that and they'll all still eventually They'll eventually emerge. emerge. And then there's, there's one of two species that have very short um, life cycles, which we'll talk about one of them later, that actually live longer as adults than this. Can they ever come out too soon? Because I've had them where they've attached to me while I was swimming. Yeah. And I wasn't sure if they knew I was coming out of the lake. And then oh, you they climbed on you while you were swimming to try to emerge on you? Well, well they didn't know you were not a rock. That I, that, I, that I didn't know. Yeah, so they always climb up. If you're standing still long enough, they'll probably climb up on you. But they don't tend to, I don't think they would do that most of the time. Okay. I've, never, I've had them try laying eggs in me. That was one of these little pointy over pot. I thought I was, I was just standing really still trying to catch your empathies, and one, I felt this like a deer from a bite in my leg, and I went, boom, and it was uh, trying to find this pig. It was fine, actually, but I didn't hit it really hard, but it was, my bed was actually thinking I was a plant, which is kind of embarrassing. Anything else? Yes? What sort of weather conditions influence the environment? <clears throat> what do you mean? Because weather is like day to day stuff, right? So the weather, life cycles, they emerge when it gets warm enough. So this year, things are emerging late. So that's part of the answer, I suspect. Um, and they, once they started going this year, they kind of went boom. So stuff that's, there's early stuff and relatively middle season stuff all happening at once right now because the early stuff has been delayed by a couple of weeks. So if it's like very dry, let's say. If it's very dry, well, if it's very dry, then the, if the ponds dry up, then they're screwed, with one exception, which we'll talk about. So and, you know, and if it's really if it really gets really really warm and the ponds get really really warm, there's less oxygen in the ponds. That's going to maybe increase mortality of the, the nymphs in the pond as well. So a couple of years ago, there was we had that little drought. There was also some speculation of whether that affected survival of dragonflies moving into the next summer. It's really hard to get those causalities, especially when some of them live two or three years. 
Do they lay dormant? Um, the larvae lay dormant in the winter when it's cold and there's nothing going on. Yeah. Um, being able to identify male versus female, like I know it's something to do with color. It can be color. It can be. You, it's very easy to tell based on their the, the genitalia stuff. So the females have the males. Females don't have the secondary stuff at the base of the abdomen, which we'll see another picture later that I can point it out. And this is one recently. That one's an immature. I'll show it to you. But yeah, the males, the males have the secondary genitalia right at the, where the thorax meets the abdomen, and females don't. That's, that's the really obvious way. And then the structures at the end are different as well. Sometimes that's the only way. Sometimes there's color differences. So it depends on the species and the group of value flows. When these nymphs are coming out of our lake, sometimes there are smaller ones and then larger ones. Is that? Those are different species. species. Yeah. Once they come out, they're the same size. As all of them. You, again, at the end, you can come look at this collection of funny stuff, fun stuff. Okay, let's move on. Otherwise, we're never going to get done. But these are all the excellent questions. I try not to discourage curiosity. So this is a very simple question with a very simple answer. And the answer is mosquitoes. Mosquitoes. Someone said something different than mosquitoes because that's not mosquitoes. mosquitoes. Mm -hmm. Is it insects? Black flies. Black flies. Mosquitoes. Yeah. Insects. What do they do? Insects. Bugs. Bugs. Bigger than that. Now they only eat animals. They don't eat plants at all. They eat anything smaller than they are <laughs> that they can catch. This is a female damselfly. This is a female damselfly, a different species that's only a teensy little bit smaller. These little guys, it's called eastern forktail. They're voracious, nasty predators. They will eat things as big as they are. She will eat that thing like a popsicle, and they'll be fun to watch. You she'll start with the head, where the young brains are, and then. She'll and eventually the wings fall off because those are not very tasty. And then she'll just sort of eat everything down to the tip of the abdomen and you'll see it go in. She'll eat that entire thing in one sitting. And then that's probably enough for her to make a bunch of eggs. She's going to go back into the woods, come back, and lay some more eggs. And that's usually a question people ask, and I didn't, no one heard it, asked it, so I'm going to say it. Them females can lay eggs multiple times. She'll lay eggs and she'll go back, eat some more, get ready to lay more eggs. They can do it three or four times as long as they don't get eaten or die in the meantime. So they'll eat, they'll eat, they, eat lot, they eat lots of insects. Lots and lots of insects. This guy is a dragonfly, my favorite dragonfly probably, called the dragon hunter. It's, there's a dead one in here. That's eating a tiger swallowtail. If you like butterflies, <laughs> these guys eat huge things. They eat, or try to eat, Wow. Oh, wow. Wow. Really? I cannot imagine the dragon hunter actually eating a hummingbird, but it took one down. Oh, wow. These things, if these things were two and a half foot wingspans, you would be afraid. Yeah. <laughs> um, because they are just, they're like little black hot helicopters. You just see these things cruising around the stream, and then they just, you know, there are multiple pictures of this, and people have seen it. This isn't like some sort of weird internet hoax thing. I did not take this picture. They will see a hummingbird, and all this is a big flying insect. Which is what the numbers look like. <laughs> and boom! And apparently, hit it hard enough to knock it down. I don't know whether it can get through the feathers to actually kill it or something and eat it. I don't know. No one's really realized what these things happen. But yeah, a dragon hunter will try to take down a hummingbird. Will they eat stinging like these? They will eat lots? anything smaller than they are. Um, so the adults eat mostly insects, but not entirely insects. I'm not going to eat too many what about the larva, of the nymphs? What do they eat in the water? Mm -hmm. Again, quick eating. Yeah. 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 Which could include fish, fish, fish tadpoles, and then the all insects, other dragonfly nymphs. If they live two or three years, guess what? Two year olds are bigger than one year olds. I'll eat my cousin or whatever that is, or third uncle once removed. So yeah, and that's when they have this cool extendable jaw, they go down and grab stuff. So they're cannibalistic. They can be cannibalistic if, they, if, if there's a size difference within the species, either within a cohort or between, you know, years. What eats them? Bats. <laughs> so this is turned around. So that green thing is a just emerged general dragon hunter. That, so the cat said, you ate a hummingbird. Your ancestors ate a hummingbird. I'm going to eat you. Um, so birds eat them. Other dragonflies eat them. Bats might eat them, but maybe not that often, because bats are what? Nocturnal. Dragonflies are what? Diagonal. 
There's one exceptional thought of that. Um, frogs. I had a dragonfly perch on the top of a little grass stem once in the pond, and the frog was down here. The frog says, Oh, look at that. Jumps up, catches the dragonfly out of the thing, and jumps, lands back down the other side. It's a perfect little arc with a dragonfly snap in between. Um, and the tenor of dragonflies, when they first hatch out and are all expanded, they're still fluttery, their wings aren't fully developed, they haven't really figured out flight yet, and they're just birds, you'll see birds this time of year walking along the stream and pond that is grackles, song sparrows, you name it, looking for these tasty little snacks because they're not hard skinned yet, they're soft. They're tasty, you can eat them without that crunchy. They're very vulnerable. So yeah, they lay easy. hundreds of eggs. So all they need is like one or two eggs to hatch and become the little dragonflies that are doing the job. So most of them get eaten as larvae and tentacles because tentacles are very, very vulnerable. But I'll see some. Well, this is a fun story. What's going on here? It's hard to see. Praying mm -hmm. mantis has caught a pair of garners. Yeah, yeah. So this male garner here had itself attached to this female. Oh, they're all set. They're on date, right? <laughs> they're in tandem. He's going, yeah, look, I got my pink date here. And this mantis said, oh my god, that! <laughs> and it actually caught one in each claw. And the male disconnected from the female, and he's flying around like crazy. I heard this and eventually, he was just providing enough confusion that the mantis lost his balance, like going, they both flew away. Mm -hmm. But that's just sort of the same thing as a, as a giant herd trying to eat a hummingbird. And on very rare occasions, the very small ones get eaten by plants. <laughs> so this is a sundew with a little fork tail stuck in it that's probably not quite a little. So yeah, they, they eat some cool stuff. All right, a little bit about habitat next, and we'll wrap up this overall overview of natural history. So they're aquatic insects, with a couple of exceptions, they're freshwater aquatic insects. They live, but within freshwater, they're everywhere. This is a retention pond in my house. Um, you know, it's full of road runoff. There was one of those little basketball hoops in there at one point, shopping carts, you know, usual habitat features for <laughs> islands. <laughs> All sorts of junk, and it was kind of gnarly to walk around. But I had 40 something species of dragons and damsels from this pond. Just from this pond over like a two year period, I was actually surveying it fairly regularly. But there's way prettier places to survey them, like nice beaver ponds. So you, there's a bunch of species that are very common pond generals that you see all over the place. And they're kind of fun, but you get tired with them. The really cool stuff, in my opinion, comes from other rivers. Um, this is the Bearcat River of Renosophy, not too far away. And the river species vary depending on the substrate. So this is a very sandy river with lots of shade. This is a very small rocky stream. And this is the Saco River, which is big and flat and full of muck. Different species will use different rivers um, depending on the, on the characteristics. And the other cool place that they live are bogs. Where there's lots of you know, you get farther south, bogs are more famous for having northern plants. Well, the same thing is northern species of dragonflies that get south in bogs because of the conditions of the plant species and the other things there are good. So the bogs are good, so they're cool, rare stuff. Do they stay fairly localized when they fly, or do they take off? We'll tell you about that later. Okay. I won't forget that one because it's part of the thing. And there's one species in New Hampshire, which is very unique, that lives in salt marshes. So most of them are freshwater. There is one on the board in the world that lives in salt marshes. There's a couple more that can live in brackish ponds and things like that. But the seaside dragon, which is a great name, is <laughs> this little black or the young ones are black and orange dragonfly that you see in salt marshes. If you're down in the salt marshes and poke around and you see dragonflies that are little black ones, sometimes by the hundreds, they're seaside dragons, the only saltwater dragonfly on the planet. They go all the way from the Gulf of Maine, down into the Caribbean, and up the Pacific side of South of Central America. Very cool little bug. Let's see. Okay, any other questions about basic biology? I covered a lot of stuff, like people have some good questions, but do you want to ask additional questions now? Because I'm not going to answer them again. I'm going to ask them, actually, but I'm a nice person. Yes? Another one. Uh, you said the damsel flies with Zyoptera over the dragonflies. Anisoptera. Is that the... Or That's the suborder. So yeah, so there's two suborders. Look, here it is. That was a good segue, John. Yeah. <laughs> so there's actually there's, there's a zygote which are damsel flies and zoptera dragonflies. There's one group that's found in Asia that are kind of weird in between. Um, people generally think they're dragons now. And within New Hampshire, 
and most of North America, there are three families of damsels and three, six. <laughs> six families of dragons. So you get to this part, there's another family of dragons out there um, that we don't have in, in New England, and a couple more families of damsels in the, in the southern parts of the U.S., but those are the, the main nine. Uh, we're going to talk each about each of these a little bit, some very little, some more, because some are more interesting than others. And we'll start with these guys. Who has seen a damsel that looks like this? Excellent. This is a very common species. It's found in Shakti streams and some medium small rivers. It's, it's the most common of the broad-winged damsels. They're called broad-winged, not because of this, but because of the base of the wing is relatively broad and attaches. This is called the ebony jewel wing. And this is a good time to think about the names of dragonflies. So, you know, people standardize common names for birds for a long time. It wasn't until roughly 20 years ago that people came up with common names for dragonflies. This is called for Maculata. Who's going to remember that tomorrow? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Who's going to remember Ebony Jewel with, possibly? Maybe more people, hopefully. Um, because it's an awesome name. <laughs> so what happened is a committee of the Dragonfly Society of the Americas got together, presumably over a lot of beer, because <laughs> they had fun, came up with really cool names for these things. So this is a superb jewel. It's an ebony jewel. It's a sparkling jewel. There's all sorts of cool names. And we'll see more of them as we go. So these broad wings are all riparian species. Some are on big rivers, some are on small rivers. Um, there's like five species in New Hampshire, and that's the most common one. And then we have another family of spread wings, which is one of the exceptions that proves the rule, because that so flies wings are not folded together at rest. Um, but they're still adapted fly, the wings are all the same shape. It's got this long, slender abdomen, the little hammerhead shark head that damselflies have. The spread wings are pretty much all look like this, at least in New England. They're kind of grayish, brownish, with these cool blueberry eyes, and then usually some greenish turquoise stripes. Um, this is called the slender spread wing. And it is one you can tell apart from the others easily by shape, but otherwise you usually have to look at these things. The male Cersei that grabbed the female in different shapes and different species. You have to actually look at the shape of the teeth on them, and there's all sorts of crazy stuff. So they're all look pretty much the same. But these guys are cool because most of them, not all of them, lay their eggs in the fall in a plant. So they insert them into the plant, and then they don't hatch until spring when the water comes into the little vernal pools and things like that. And then they hatch out in the spring, and then they mature over the course of the summer and hatch out again you know, the following <coughs> fall because the ones that do that. So there is a case where the, the life cycle of the larva is actually less than a year in many cases. But the egg is still closer to a year. Fun stuff. How is that? that one is about this long. The damselflies, the biggest ones are like the, the, the ebony drooling, or it's actually the ebony drooling up here is about an inch, inch and a half. And the small ones are like this that are about an inch. Who's seen those little, little bright electric blue damselflies? Have you seen this one? <laughs> yeah, but I guess what? You probably haven't unless you've been to the southwest. <laughs> U.S. Uh, south, southeast U.S. This is a fun, this is, these, I, I'll go on about these because these are cool. Because of some cool stories. These are the bluest. One set of pond damsels are bluest. Pond damsels are all relatively small, inch and a half or smaller damselflies. Usually in ponds, a few are in streams. Within that group, there's one genus called the bluets. Not to be confused with plant called the bluet. It's the genus Enelagma. Um, and they, a lot of them are blue. This is one. Get ready to see the totally obvious differences between that one and the different species. See? You can do this. This one actually is easy because this little guy here has a little blue stripe through the middle of its black stripe. The only one that has that, but we don't have those in New Hampshire. Everyone in New Hampshire looks like this, with a different amount of black on some of those segments, but sometimes not. This critter here is called the marsh fluid. The only way you can tell it from another species that's otherwise identical, including most of its DNA, is by looking at this little thing here. So you have to catch it, get a hand lens. In this case, this was not the same species. I look at those claspers with magnification, and you can see the different shapes and so forth. And that's literally the only way some of these species can be told apart. There's one pair, they can only be told apart with a microscope. 
they're so close you can't even deal with a regular little like, penguin and stuff. And they're pretty cool. And there's like 20 species of Enelagma in New Hampshire. More so. The Northeast is the hotbed of Enelagma diversity. Um, I'll get to another project I'm working on. There's four species that are endemic to New England, southern New York, and northern New Jersey. One of which also gets into, get into New Brunswick. But they probably speciated during the glacial period and they got isolated and some really cool stuff happened. So there's, some, there's 20 species of these guys, and most of them are blue. See, most of them you have to catch to tell what they are. But, some are red. <laughs> <laughs> this has got one of the best names ever identified. That's a It's called the Scarlet Bluet. <laughs> <laughs> um, because they wanted to keep the bluet there as an indicator that they're related to the other bluets. But this is a bright cherry red identified. There's a couple of bluish or reddish or purplish or yellowish ones out there. Um, we'll talk more about this one later. This is possibly my favorite one made of all. For one reason, anyway. We'll get to it. So not all the bluets are blue, but all the damselflies are small and pretty cool. All right, moving on to the big stuff. This is the green darner, common green darner. You may have seen these. They're bright blue abdomens, bright green everything else. They're huge. They're like this big. And you'll see them flying along the edges of the ponds. You'll see them migrating. If you go to like migrating bird spots, you'll see migrating green darners. Um, and Recently, people did a cool study about migration in, in green darners using all sorts of techniques, including radioactive isotopes and DNA and whatever else. And if you live in New Hampshire, Maine, and I'm more than Maine people here, do you see green darners this time of year, late, late mid-May to mid to late June? That green darner flew here from somewhere south of here, probably the southeastern U.S. It's going to get here, sort of mate, to lay eggs. Those eggs will mature very quickly over the course of the summer because they're in very warm, vegetated ponds full of yummy things to eat. And they will hatch out again in August, September, and fly south. And for a long time, we didn't know what happened between them. Where did they go? Did they, did they live all winter, like the monarch butterflies do? Right? We all know the monarch butterflies, right? They, they hopscotch the way north, they breed here, then they migrate down to Mexico for the winter, and then migrate north to Texas and start building over again. But they don't eat, they just hang out in trees all winter. They're not predators. They can kind of quiet down. These things fly a lot. So they can't just go in the torpor. Veriflies are not known to go in the torpor as adults. So what happens is they fly to South America or the Caribbean or Florida and reproduce again. And the same thing as the monarchs, it turns out. Without, we don't know the details yet, but they will mate, have no generation, and eventually the generation comes back north and starts opening over again. Which is pretty cool. Yes? You said earlier that the uh the adult phase is at most a month or two, well, most months. of the time. Right. So if these are migrating back and forth, back and forth, how long? Uh, yeah, so those adults are going to live a couple of months, and so they have to mate again at the bottom. So it's probably like five or six generations a year that are doing this to make the whole loop. But one, one generation is going to make the big jump north, another generation is going to make the jump south, and then at the bottom, in, this, in the winter is where we're not really sure exactly what's going on yet. They might live a little longer if they're not as migratory, but yeah, there's some big, so if you want to work on that, there's probably a PhD in there for you. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's, really, there's, there's some really cool stuff about dragonfly migration that we don't know yet. People actually put radio transmitters on these things. Little tiny ones that you need to track that like last like a week because the batteries are so tiny. And a guy was putting them on in southern New Jersey at Cape May and then tracking them with an airplane as they crossed Delaware Bay like the birds do in the fall. So it's just really cool stuff that these things do. All right, next, next group of, of dragons are the like club tails, so named because most of them have an expanded and the are random, they're very cool. These are very attractive bugs. They usually have these really bright green bodies with yellow bits. They, they hang out in rivers most of the time. Um, and that is it for that reason. They're attractive and they're elusive. They're hard to catch because this guy's got kind of a bit of a rock somewhere. And I had to sneak up in the river with my camera. And you're freaking at it, you know, ah, and they're gone. They're hard to catch. They're elusive. People think they're really cool. They're very popular about dragonfly enthusiasts. And then in, in the club tail group is our friend, dun dun dun, the dragon. It's just Captain Kitchen. It's the story about big it is. That's my hand. <laughs> this thing landed. I was walking along the stream. This thing landed on my hand. And so I very carefully moved my hand up like this. And then very carefully put the camera in the other hand and took a few pictures before it flew away. It was, you know, it's just, it wasn't afraid of me. He said, I'm going to eat you. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that's just a really cool picture of the 
of the dragon. And the cocktail, so the only dragonflies where the eyes don't touch. The amplifies eyes are always separate. But the only <laughs> dragonfly where they don't touch. Okay. And that's just a really cool. I love dragon hunters so much. Okay, two small groups. There's only three species of spike tails and two species of cruisers in New Hampshire. They're both river species. They're both brown or black with yellow marks. They both have green eyes. And they fly around the streams. I'm not going to talk about them anymore. And then we have the emeralds, which, guess why they're called emeralds? Could it beat those eyes? And the emeralds are mostly a northern group. There's a couple of species that get all the way to the southeast and U.S., but most of them are, are northern. They're one of these multi-year bugs in most cases. They're common in bogs and tundra and things like that. The northernmost oatlates in the world are, are emeralds up in, the, up in the tundra, edge of the tree line where it actually, you know, the ground freezes in the winter, so they've got to figure that out. Um, they're usually very, not very well marked. They're kind of cool metallic sheen, but they're very black. Um, sometimes there's a bit of markings in the wings, but they're very nondescript. You really have to look at those sexual parts to tell some of them apart. But this is an emerald. Hmm. Now, what is different about this picture compared to every other picture you've seen so far today? Now, I know what people are going to say. Go ahead and say that. Oh, whoa! That's the first time you said that first. Some, uh, somehow we were talking about the wings are different or whatever. She said it's nighttime. This picture was taken at night with a flash. So this dragonfly is crepuscular, which means it's active at dusk. Probably not as much dawn because it's colder at dawn. So just before sunset, these things come out. They start flying around near the streams where they do feed. And you know, until a little bit after sunset, it's getting too dark, maybe they can't see, and then they go hide in trees the rest of the day. So they basically eat for like an hour a day, which is they get a lot of food an hour a day. And they've got, this has got the, the again, I always say the superlative, but this is probably, in my opinion, one of the top two or three coolest names. It's better than Scarlet Blue, and it's better than Emmy Dueling. This is the Stygian Shadow Dragon. <laughs> so, Shadow Dragon makes sense, right? It's actually like, what does Stygian come from? This is a true quiz of your liberal arts education. Anybody know what Stygian comes from? What's S-T-Y make you think of if you think about mythology? River Styx. Which is what? Hell. 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 It's the river of the underworld. It's dark, it's dismal, it's scary, it's full of you know, things. So this is a nocturnal, so his name is, it lives in rivers. So this is like the coolest name, I don't know how they came up with it. You know, the other ones are the Alabama Shadow Dragon, it's kind of boring. Cinnamon Shadow Dragon, it's kind of, that's kind of cool, it's kind of that color. Umber Shadow Dragon, Stygian Shadow Dragon. It's like this, there's a Stygian owl in Latin America, which is also this dark colored owl that lives, it's an owl at night. So just, just think of images of three-headed dogs and stuff, and you're all set. So they're hard to catch, because it's dark. So basically, I'm up to my waist in a bathing suit in the river next to my house, swimming in net in almost darkness. And eventually you can catch them and then take pictures of them. But this is the same species that that one with the bad wing at the very beginning was. Okay, last but not least, and the most diverse, the most popular, are the skimmers. So most of the ragbugs you see that land on your kayak, land on your head, whatever, are skimmers. One third of the species of Odinates in New Hampshire are skimmers. Another third are, dip, are pond dams, everything else is split up on the other, other groups. And they're often beautiful looking things, bold and colored, with markings on their wings, and it's bright, and tall in the dark abdomen. And you guess what this thing is called? Flashlight. Hmm? Flashlight. Flashlight. <laughs> cool. That's a good name. There's actually something called a Lucifer damsel, because it's like a glow in the dark thing. Any other guesses? What's the most, name two most obvious things you like? Name the color and the body part. White tail. This is a common white tail. Extra cookie for them. <laughs> And the cool thing, when you see these bright white colors on dragonflies are sort of powdery blue, that's actually a wax-like substance that they excrete from their, from their cuticle. It's not a color, it's not a pigment, it's actually like the blush on, the, on an apple. So that's the male. Very obvious, he's all territorial, he's going to say, look at me, I'm tough, you don't want to get mad at me, blah, blah, blah. Female, on the other hand, looks like that. Yeah. <laughs> Very cryptic. Even the pattern of wings is different, right? He's got these big black things, he's got black spots. You know, blends in with the, the blob she's in. So they're probably cryptic a little bit, so they can survive longer while they're up in the woods 
get a group up, you're ready for. So when they get to the pond, they're not going to get eaten by another dragonfly as quickly because they're the ones that are important. They've got all the eggs. So very different male and female in this case. Same with this. This is the eastern pond hawk, female on the left, male on the right. Again, all that color on the male is this waxy stuff, this pruinosity that gets excreted from the shell. And when the male pond hawk hatches out, it looks like the female. And then, then that blue appears as it matures. So they would look just like the female when they first come out of the water. These things are also vicious predators. They'll eat things the same size as they are. People have probably seen little red ones in, in meadows starting in late July or August. Those are called meadow hawks. There's like five kinds. They're all very similar. This is a point where I bring up, I forget to mention this every other time, but I always use it here because it's very obvious. You may have excuse me, noticed that every dragonfly has a pigmented thing near the tip of each wing. Go back one, you'll see them on the pond hawks. Not as easily. They're there. Let me go back. It won't go back. I know it can go on forever. Those are called pseudostigmata. Another mythology reference here. What's the stigmata? The wounds on Christ, right? Yeah. So they're, they're little marks at the end of its wings. So this guy wasn't actually crucified, but they, that's what they, they call them. So people name things in biology after all sorts of cool references. And what we think these are for is that there's, a little, there's more pigment there. So they're a little tiny bit heavier. And therefore, it kind of, it's like a little stabilization thing. It kind of knows where the end of its wings are when it's flying. No one really sure how that actually works, but that's what people conclude that they're for. This is adorable. Wow. This is the smallest opening in New Hampshire. That's my thumb. This is a dragonfly that's really tiny. There's one in the case. It's called the Elfin Skimmer. It lives in bogs. It's just it's like a little tiny, like, you know, we all like little things, right? Little things are cute. This is adorable. There's something. This is adorable. Um, you should not hold dragonflies by the legs, by the way, because they will break off. You know, I'm a professional. <laughs> and I think this is the last skimmer picture. This is, this is a very famous beast, not that individual. This is something called the wandering glider. In Europe, it's called the globe skimmer. This is the most widely distributed insect by its own means. Cockroaches may be everywhere too, but they didn't get there on their own. On the planet, this is recorded on every single continent except Antarctica, where there's no fresh water that's liquid. On most oceanic islands, this thing crosses the Pacific Ocean from Asia to Hawaii, and then from Hawaii to North America. There is a TED talk about this species. If, you, if, you, if you're bored later today, you can Google it. This guy gives a TED talk about the migration of the wandering glider around the Indian Ocean. Follow the winds. The winds blow it south over the ocean during the monsoons, and then it does like a green darter. It migrates north and hops as it breeds, breeds, moves, breeds, moves, breeds, moves back to India. So it moves around the Indian Ocean. Um, and you'll see these in late summer showing up on nice warm south winds. They will lay their eggs in temporary ponds and pools because they can re they, their larvae can go from egg to adult in five or six weeks. So the adults will live longer than the nymphs, in this case, probably the only species, a group of species that can do that. Um, they will also think that car hoods reflecting the sunlight are ponds. You will see a dragonfly on a car hood going dip, 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 dip. Every single egg goes pssst, 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 pssst. Uh -huh. Because they think it's a reflective lake as a pond and they're going to lay their eggs in it. Cool, this is, so that's a strategy for a very quick dispersal. They're going to find a temporary pond, lay eggs in it, the babies hatch out and fly off again. The carbons are not water and they don't do well there. Okay, so any questions about some of that stuff? And there's one more little section to go about. And then people can get their cookies. People can keep a track of these cookies, right? And you got them. You got them. I get three. So, any other questions about the basic cool stuff? Because now I'm going to talk a little bit about focusing on New Hampshire. I can't talk to Maine, but there's similar things that have been done in Maine. How did they come up with the name Dragon? I mean, because they breathe fire, didn't you know? <laughs> I, think, I, think, I think it's just because they're... I missed they're, that one. <laughs> I think you must not sleeping, no cookie. No, it's probably just because they're vicious, you know, and the sounds more delicate. Yeah. 
<laughs> They're just as vicious, like, you yeah, have those little guys. Yeah, I think it's just because, you know, why do we call anything what we call it? Some weird thing in the back of our ancient brains. So this is the Dragon Hunter again, his final appearance, actual size. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> so look, we are, we are right here. So this, is, this was our logo for this project um, the first year, and then it changed every time we got a new record. So this is where the Dragon Hunter was found in New Hampshire when we started the project. It's much more widespread than that, obviously. So this was a project, oh wait, back, sorry. So way back in 1973, these two guys, Al White, who I know, is still around, and Raleigh Morse, they were both at UNH, went through museum collections and people's you know, notes and blah, 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 and made a list of every species of odinate known for the state. They came up with 134 species. Any guesses how many we know there are now? 350. 350, that's way high. This, unfortunately. <laughs> Any other guesses? 200. It's closer. 165, last time I checked. So we've added, some people say lower, which is always sad. But what's happened is we've learned a lot more about dragonflies in the last 40 years. And uh, we'll talk about that. Because back, back then, there was not a lot of popular interest in dragonflies. It wasn't until the late 1990s when people started making field guides to them. There was an old field guide that a friend of mine wrote, Jones by the Dragonflies of Cape Cod, back from about 96 or 7. And then a few others popped up in here and there. And then people got interested. The people, naturalists, people like me and some of you that like identifying things in the world, whether it's wildflowers or butterflies or snakes or birds, we just, oh, what are these dragonflies? I don't know. I should, like, if I brought it with me, I could show you this. There's a book this thick, this big, this thick, that's a guide to the dragonflies of North America. But it's all based on the like, economist keys. You have to catch it, you have to look at the wing venation, look at the number of spines on leg three, whatever it is, and key it out, which is tedious and boring and not very enlightening. But then they feel they have a picture. So, oh, look at that one. It's got a blue spot here and not a blue spot, blah, blah, blah. And people got interested in dragonflies because it was a resource they could use to identify it. None of these guys are entomologists. This guy's an engineer with a reservoir, or at least we retired recently in West He's a French teacher at a private school. He's a birder. I don't know him at all. But they're all just people that got into dragonflies and started looking for them. This was at a meeting in New York where 20, 30 people descended on the bogs of the Adirondacks and looked for dragonflies for three days. So interest became much bigger. People got in, people were able to learn things, identify things, and we learned a lot more about what was going on. And this is a cool, I love maps. So this is the number of species per county in 1973 based on that little book that I showed you. You know, here's a quiz. Why is this, this is, you know, this is, here you guys are, right here. Right, here's, here's Lakefield, and here's Acton. This is Stratford County. Why is there so many species of dragonflies and dragonflies known from Stratford County way down there? Lots of universities. University. Yeah, UNH is there. <laughs> Hell, why are all the there? And all the students for generations have been forced to take insect collections for entomology classes are there. So they have a lot of data on, on the Durham area. And then everything up here, this is a fun story. The, one, the northern part of the state, was maybe not so much in Maine, was, was, was accessible. People would come up from Boston and Philadelphia by train to Mount, the Mount White Mountains, go look for northern dragonflies. It was destination entomology. So famous, very famous people in the dragonfly world. Philip Calvert, everybody knows Philip Calvert, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, he was from Philadelphia, and he'd come up to Boston, take a train up here. And he had, the first records on the, ever of several species are from the White Mountains. Um, the type locality is Hermit Lake in the White Mountains at the base of Buckingham's Ravine. People go there because you could hike up to it very easily, swing your net around, find things that were not known to science. So people were poking around up in this area for a long time. I'm not sure why Hillsborough County was doing so well back then, but somebody must have been there. Then it changed. We let people loose with field guides, and all of a sudden, Stratford County's not so hot anymore. In fact, it's like, you know, third smallest. You know, we got the Merrimack Valley's good. Everything's pretty equal. 100-something species per county. It gets better. We'll get back to that. If you do it by town, very quickly, <laughs> there's Durham. There's the White Mountains, and then 20 years later, 30 years later, you get this map. And this map is very fun because you can tell why each town is purple. 
purple means 75 or more species. So half the species in the state are known from these towns. This is UNH. I live in Concord. I used to live in Northfield. <laughs> My friend Martha, who is a big crime expert, lives in Chichester. That French teacher on that picture, he lives just off the border and goes into Hollis. Another friend lives in Merrimack and Amherst. And I got paid one year to do surveys in Canaan. <laughs> so where people will go look is where you found things. So that's still a pretty biased survey. It's eight people plus UNH to be responsible for that map. And obviously there's huge holes. You know, there's places up north, you know, there's not much going on. We wanted to learn what was going on. And thus was born the New Hampshire Geographic Survey. So it's a five-year project, 2007 to 11. We have three goals. The first two are kind of the same. This list, let's fill in the holes, especially for species that we think are rare. Are they really rare? We don't know. And fill the holes in. And then what this talk is not worth of, and this project ended in 2011, it's now 2019. For eight years I've been giving this talk, and it's, everybody loves it. I hope you guys do too. Which is part of this whole thing. And we're still doing stuff about this talk, about this project. So we trained people over four years, 250 or so people. Came to workshops, learned about dragonflies, maybe a fifth of those continued to collect data, submitted data, which we could update the maps with. Just for example, this is the map from 2008 where people went. Um, you know, we, mostly in the south, south, all the people in the Hampshire are here. You know, this is, this is, this is full of sock splotches and things. <laughs> this is similar, I guess. So, you know, we, had, we realized we had a problem there. So what we did was, okay, we need to cover Coas County and the North Country and White Mountains a little better. So we organized what we called the Coas County Odo Blitzes, where a half a dozen people or so would just go up for a couple of nights camping and just ode the hell out of the place. And you know, the map you'll see later will indicate most of the dots in Coas County are from our little groups of, of crazy people. This is in a little bog in the middle of nowhere in Pittsburgh. You have to bushwhack into. And so yeah, there's your map. So again, here's all the people are. But then, you know, everything up there and here is largely due to a handful of people doing those sort of things. But that's a lot of data. 18,000 records, 157 species. 200, it's like 280 something pounds in New Hampshire. We got data for 221. And there's just a little thank you to some volunteers. People, you know, lose their shoes and palms. We actually caught a dragonfly in this. Driving on the roads in Pittsburgh, we had a bunch of school girls, middle school girls, on um, the Merrimack River, learning to catch dragonflies, identify dragonflies, and all sorts of good stuff. And here, finally, are some stories about what we learned. Is that a question? Yes. Yeah. Who keyed all these? Everybody, people that went to the workshops learned how to identify them. <laughs> they had to kill them. <laughs> they didn't have to kill them. Some species you can identify without killing them. Some species you can take a photograph. And there's only a, a handful, we try to minimize the number of dead dragonflies to deal with, because many people don't want to kill them necessarily. It's not fun. I always apologize when I kill one. Um, I do. <laughs> but, so there's a few that are really hard to tell apart that people require to create a specimen of that so we can look at it with a microscope or something. But most of the time, you know, think about that common white tail. Like, who's going to get that one? Yeah. Right? Most of know what they're doing, and people have cameras. So we got most of them were, you know, there's a few that we weren't sure if they did them right, then we didn't keep them in the database, basically. So this guy, this one's a female actually, the ring bog hunter, which is a pretty cool name, and the bog hunter is cooler, it's a different species, is the only species that's listed as endangered or threatened in New Hampshire. When we started this project, it was listed as, as endangered. It was only found in seven towns. But, 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 but they call here in the kind of destroyed part of the state. Right? You know, this, you know, this is what I call the Bermuda Triangle, which is Manchester, Nashville, Salem, and Boone. You know, it's just strip malls and subdivisions and all sorts of nasty things. And then the other ones are there in Rochester, which isn't a whole lot better. So we only moved them seven places, or eight places. We let people loose. We found them in a bunch more places. We doubled the number of locations of the species in five years. And since then, we found a few more. So <coughs> as a result of this project, we actually downloaded it from endangered to threatened. So we found out that this species, with all was rare, was a little less rare than we thought, which is really cool. And I think they should be up here. They're up this far, they're in Friburg. So they should be in this little area we've been looking but haven't found them, so keep your eyes open. Don't kill one, they're protected. This is my friend, they don't do it. 
So again, this is a really cool story. Until 2001, we did not know the species occurred in New Hampshire at all. I don't know above name, sorry. And then three of us found them in three different places, here, here, and here, the same year, July of 2001. Over the next couple of years, we found them in a couple other places. So they're rare. That's fine. This species, we talked to people from Long Island and Cape Cod, is a coastal plain pond species. These are these shallow ponds on Cape Cod that are fringed with vegetation, sandy bottom. You know, we have doesn't actually have any coastal plain ponds. The first clue of something's weird is that this record is from Lake Nagasaki, which is not a pond. It's also not really a coastal plain. But then we collect the data, tons of it, and all of a sudden this thing is everywhere. So the green stuff is things since the survey ended, and I just put, you know, I'm adding more probably in another three weeks. But all of a sudden, they're in every single county in the state. They are north of the White Mountains in Burma. That is not the coastal plain by any definition, and Winnipesaukee is still not a pond. So we basically just, they're everywhere. There are 60-something records for the species in the state now, which is more than almost any other state. And so what we're really curious about is why are they so common here? What are they, what are they doing differently? So a little brief segue to something that's not directly related to this, but it's kind of a fun story. This is one of those four species that's only found from New Jersey to Maine. We actually got a big grant two, two years ago to study those four species and update our databases. All, half of those green squares are from last year where volunteers and I found new locations for the species. Because in Massachusetts and New York and Rhode Island and Connecticut where they're they're rare-ish. They're listed as threatened or endangered in New York and Connecticut. It's a special concern or something in Massachusetts and Maine. Um, but in New Hampshire, they're everywhere. They're pretty common in Maine, too. They've recently been discovered in New Brunswick. So in the north, they're doing really well. In the south, they're probably, Long Island is not a happy place for natural systems. They're pretty common in New Jersey. So what's going on with the species we don't know, we're collecting data on it and the other three that are in this area to see what we can learn about distributions and habitat and things like that. If I was doing that on the way here today, I stopped and looking for damselflies in ponds between Concord, <laughs> Concord and Macton. I think this might be the last of the little maps. Mm. This is a fun story. This guy, one of these little cocktails, lives on rivers. I've actually only seen adults twice. This is one of them. I've seen hundreds of exuvia. And someone found an exuvia on the Merrimack River back in 2004 or something, I think it might have been. So that's a rare, rare dragonfly. If you look for exuvia specifically, you find out that it's all on the Merrimack River and the Kuntuka River. And it's actually on the Sapa too. So if we didn't, if we were just trying to find adults, we would not know where this thing was. So this is the story that if you look for the larva or the exuvia, you can actually learn a whole lot that you couldn't learn otherwise. So that's why the nymphs are important. How big is that? That's, that one is pretty cute. It's about this big. All right. Thank you. Oh, and one more. This is climate change, probably. 1973, two locations of the entire state. And again, it was not a lot of data, but there was data. By 2007, they were kind of spread up at the lakes region of the Connecticut River. And then by 2011, they spread far up the Connecticut River up into the edge of the White Mountains, and they're still going. Um, this little guy is a very common species of warm, shallow, mucky ponds with lily pads and algae and everything else. So wherever those are, it does well. And as long as it's warming up and there's more on his ponds, it's pretty slowly. It's one of several species that are pretty more southern that are slowly moving north, at least partially as a result of climate change. And finally, to add a third map, where we, I can tell you who did each of these. I can't do that anymore. So we've got people all over the place doing stuff, and we've basically filled the stadium pretty well. You know, there's still some holes up north, but considering how far away that is and how shallow it is to get people up there, it's not bad. And what's really fun is that you can see these with asterisks. There's four of them, there's actually a few more right now. There's like five or six towns that have over 100 species in them. Concrete has 118. That's the best in the state so far. That is more species in California. So the final question to keep you guys from falling asleep, the new good, is why would con and it's not just California concrete. Right? <laughs> California is full of biologists. It's a huge state. There's lots of biologists out there. Not me. I'm not taking credit for this. 
I think you could have at least found them. The reason Concord has a lot for me to find is why. Why does Concord or Amherst or even um, Stratford or Durham, why are they, for tiny little New Hampshire towns, why don't they have more species in the entire state of California? Or water. Exactly. The West is dry. There's water there, but it's not a lot of it. That's why California's on fire every year now. Mm -hmm. You know, there's this name a river in California. Los Angeles. Is there, is there one called Los Angeles River? It's not very big, is it probably, though? Yeah, almost. Yeah. Long. It's long. You know, the only one I can think of is a Tijuana, which is dry half the time as well, and the Sacramento, which is actually the biggest one that comes out of the Sierra. You know, we're, name a river in, in Wakefield, they're active. It's like probably 12. <laughs> Um, just because you live it, you've got bias. But the West is relatively dry. There's less diversity of habitats in the West. The East is full of fresh water, full of diversity. We have glaciers making all sorts of cool ponds. So we've got tons of diversity. So, you know, New Hampshire has 165 species. That's more than all of Europe. It's like 115, 120 species in Europe. And that's, again, people are looking in Europe. <laughs> Europe is full of people dating back to Aristotle looking at stuff like this. Europe just has less diversity for whatever reason. Um, one theory is that the glaciers have spilled it all against the Alps. So, you know, whereas our glaciers, the mountains do this, some things can go south, and the Europe, the glaciers push everything against the Alps. Who knows? But Europe is just less dragonflies. <coughs> so, that's the little thing on this, just is that, you know, there's some huge diversity of these guys. This is Milton, right? There's two towns over. I know, that's Holly Grant. She did that. Um, but you know, the tiny little town is going to have half the species in the state. Of so yeah, what we do with these data now? They're still doing this. Um, it's hard to think, hard to believe that you know, just in 15 years, we'll have to do this over again. If we want to see if things have changed. So okay, what's moved north? Has anything gotten more common, less common? You know, nothing seems to be really rare except for one or two. So we, you know, it's just really fascinating stuff. And if we close with another blue it. Um, I'm not sure what kind that one is, <laughs> but she caught it and uh, it's going to take it in. So that is my story, and hopefully it was a good one. Right.